Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the closing keynote of Library 2.015. What a great, terrific long day this has been. Such a such a terrific day. So appreciative of everybody who's attended and spoken. And Toby Greenwald, Toby, thanks for being here. My pleasure, Steve. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm really delighted that you're getting to wrap us up. Thanks to San Jose State University School of Information. They've been a terrific partner of this conference. This is the fifth year of our conference. And Sandra, Dr. Sandra Hirsch, who's our opening keynote speaker, is co-chair of the conference as well. And they've done a terrific job. And it's just been a great event this year. Thanks to Sizzle, to Joyce Valenza and Ross Todd, and yesterday's teacher librarian, pre-conference day to Blackboard Collaborate for this platform, to Wilma. And of course, this is a Learning Revolution project event. So the brave few who have stuck with us all day and are here at the end, you get to tell us where you are in the world. Looks like it's morning in India. So we have some good representation from around the world. Looks like New Zealand. South America, Australia. Do go ahead and put your location and maybe the time if you're interested in the chat. Three PM in the Wellington. in Australia, <clears throat> Buenos Aires, Silvina, welcome. Anyway, it's been a terrific day. Please keep those messages going in the chat, but I'm going to move our slides forward. Toby Greenwald is Director of Digital Strategy and Technology Integration at Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh. In his 10 years of library experience, he has sought to highlight the overlaps between technology, library service, and community. In doing so, he brings a pragmatic, human-centered approach to creating meaningful library experiences in both physical and virtual worlds. Toby, again, welcome and thank you. My pleasure, Steve. Thanks for, thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this. And uh, I've got to say, it's a real thrill to just close out the evening with all of you. Although, actually, some of you, I suppose, uh, on the other side of the globe, I get to uh, start the day with, with some of you. Um, so um, today, I want to share a few stories about what's been going on at Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh and how we've really embraced our role as a connector of dots within the community. Um, I know we've talked a lot today um, throughout a lot of the, the, the keynotes and the other presentations about emerging trends and how to embrace um, innovation and, and new ideas. And as I've been working, I've been focusing a lot more on how do we take those innovations and make them real in a way that, that really meets community needs and feels organic to um, our neighbors and our um, partner organizations. Um, I came to Pittsburgh about two years ago to oversee the library's digital strategy. Um, in that time, I quickly realized that our success has much less to do with identifying these new trends as they emerge, um, as it does with making the community as a whole a safer place for learning, experimentation, and collaborative growth. Um, but by seeking out all of these connections between our own services, linking with community groups, and playing information matchmaker all over town, we're making our work more visible to the public and really demonstrating our value to our stakeholders. Uh, if we happen to venture into uncharted territory in the process, well, you know, so be it. Um, but before I get into that, I want to provide a little backstory. I want to tell you a little bit about my Willie Lohman moment as a librarian. Let's jump all the way back to 2011. I know, such a long time ago. It was a simpler time, really. Barack Obama was president, and we all entertained ourselves by looking at pictures of cats on the Internet. And I had a job as the virtual services coordinator at the Skokie Public Library, right in the middle of the Chicago suburbs. In this newly created position, it was my job to introduce new technologies to all levels of the organization. It required me to look out for new and upcoming trends and find ways to integrate them into our existing body of services. 
I didn't have a staff or a budget, but I had a lot of trust from the powers that be in my ability to translate new and shiny tech tools into practical library services. The same still works me well as a public instructor. I spent a lot of time working with our patrons to introduce them to new skills and to help them learn how to get the most out of their devices. This is me uh, teaching a group of our users how to use the T9 texting mode on their flip phone. And I gotta say, looking at this photo just makes me feel really old. Um, fundamental to my spiel was the reminder that it was actually quite different to break, it was actually quite difficult to break things. And if they went into the practice with a willingness to learn, they could do anything. And it was really pretty effective. Um, but all that changed around 2011. Once the smartphone market hit a tipping point and the iPad really reached a wider market saturation among my patrons. Um, I created an introduction to iPad class and about 20 minutes into my kind of go-to lecture style, um, the entire flow was disrupted with questions from the audience who wanted to know how to do specific things on their devices. I didn't realize it at the time, but this signaled a major shift in the way that my patrons and my staff alike responded to technology. There's usually something of a learning curve between where someone learns the basics and where someone starts to develop a customized experience for themselves. Um, by embracing more comprehensive design principles, portable smart devices had reduced this gap considerably, making everyone's experience far more of a unique thing and something much harder to teach in a group environment. Likewise, introducing technology to staff switched from being a matter of trying to cajole um, other departments into trying new things to really trying to get everybody um, across the organization to slow their collective role in their efforts to try to do every new thing at once. Uh, tech time suddenly belonged to everyone, and not just those of us who were kind of the tech librarians by default. But if I was going to avoid becoming a relic, I had to learn how to work with the growing demand for customized services, and not just work with them, but to make this demand work for me. And little did I know it, but another situation was taking place 500 miles to the east. It was about to disrupt everything. Um, Pittsburgh, as some of you may know, had been in the middle of a decades-long financial crisis brought on by the collapse of the steel industry. Funny, at Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh was hit particularly hard by the collapse of the, uh, the housing market. And it certainly didn't help that the original charter put in by Andrew Carnegie stipulated that the city was only required to provide the library $40,000 a year. What, they, what we all would have given for the words adjust for inflation in this charter. Um, with state funding dropping um, by about 20% in 2009, the situation was pretty dire for CLP. While the funding didn't get better, cutting hours would only be the start of a long wave of attrition. Branches would eventually have to be closed, staff would have to be let go, and that death spiral was all but inevitable. The library had to take a fairly desperate action um, and ask a cash-strapped population for a tax increase just in order to survive. Uh, after a two-year campaign, the community responded in time, approving a referendum with 71% of the vote. Um, it was at this point that the CLPD collective realized that they couldn't take this kind of gift and this kind of trust for granted. From here on out, the library had to make sure that any work they did had to demonstrate a return on their community's investment. And that meant thinking differently about how they showed their work. After initiating a new strategic plan in 2012, they created two new departments, the Office of Outreach Programs and Partnerships and the Office of Digital Strategy and Technology Integration. I came to head the latter group in early 2014, kind of blowing up my entire life in Chicago, and we've been working together to reinvent our service model since then. Um, oops, uh, this shift from, uh, so we've been, sh I'm gonna just jump, sorry. Um, a major goal of the strategic shift centers on thinking less about outputs and more about outcomes. Right now, most of our interactions to be summed up with this. Um, you start with some moment of inspiration. A uh, patron you know, has an idea, or they see something in the paper, or they have a problem that they need to have solved. Then there's an interaction where they come and they contact us or they look something up on our OPAC or in one of our databases. And then there's a transaction where they, you know, they get their question answered, they get their thing, they attend their program, they check out their book, and it's sort of the end of the, the whole thing. Once the transaction is finished, there's really no way for the library to pick up where the previous interaction left off. If the patron comes back in, there's really nothing to guarantee that any staff member will remember what happened before. Um, and that's, you know, then that's even if it's the same staff member who handed the transaction at the beginning. There's something of a forced amnesia, a spot where library workers and patrons alike are forced to start from scratch every time they come back to the library. Digital tools are making it much easier to create a better collective memory. 
Having constant access to portable technology and pervasive, powerful Internet access makes it easier for all of us to document and share our lives with one another. Regardless of how you feel personally about this phenomenon, it presents a real opportunity for us to make reflection this final component of the transaction and to complete the circle. If this is happening publicly, then our users become just as much a part of the inspiration cycle. What becomes the end product for one user becomes inspiration for the next set of users. This is probably already happening already in every one of our libraries. We've just got to make, we just, just got to give this process enough of a nudge to make it more visible and lay better claim to those things that our users accomplish. Um, in doing so, we're reinforcing the point that the library functions as the hub of our community. And by you know, keeping track of all the chatter that's taking place online and off, it gives us a ready pile of evidence to point to when we deal with our stakeholders. Uh, if we can do this internally and with our users' permission, we can do a much better job of providing customized services that speak to individual user needs and to turn the library experience into more of a fluid, ongoing relationship. This only smooths out the seams from one transaction to another, but over time it makes for a comprehensive library experience that runs from the first time they come in as a baby to the last time they ever, they ever use that part of organizations. Um, tonight I want to talk about how this applies to our work with our community partners. If we can make the line between our stuff and their stuff just a little bit blurrier, we can serve as this connective tissue between these disparate organizations. Doing this requires a strong sense of purpose and an ability to work beyond one's walls and an ability to trust your neighbors. Doing so places us in a prime position to act as strong role models for public citizenship and community behavior. Tech writer Annalee Newitz has a theory that we're moving from the information age to the infrastructure age. In a world where potentially everything is connected to a network, there's a greater sense of common ground between all the things we use and all the interactions we make. By actively connecting the dots between these community actions and our community partnerships, libraries uh, are uniquely positioned to build their own kind of infrastructure, building a host of new jumping on points for people to engage and make your impact that much more visible to the outside world. Um, we can see how this plays out in the way I eventually adapted my iPad classes for this new set of demands. Rather than holding traditional lectures, I had what was called happy hour, where everyone brought in their device. We went around the room, and people first shared one thing that they really liked about their device, which inevitably resulted in uh, other members of the audience discovering new things. And then we went around the room again, and people shared things that they um, were areas where they were stuck. And this led to people realizing that they knew a lot more about the devices than they actually knew. I didn't, and my presence there really ended up being kind of immaterial as everyone ended up helping one another. Um, this is from the Arlington Heights Library in the Chicago suburbs, and they went even further by holding the class right out on the public floor. This increased the visibility factor, you know, introduced this idea of being excellent in public, and really encouraged more people to contribute to the conversation. This all reinforces the fact that this is something that we're all learning together. I'm going to jump back to this. This, um, this shift from transactional activity to collaborative activity allows the library as an organization to act as a flywheel for community efforts. Um, and of course, this is the, the, the device that helps to build momentum within an engine or a power plant. Um, by using its own institutional heft and the collective trust that its community has, has put into it, this can help build momentum where momentum didn't exist before. And effectively, the library becomes a force multiplier for turning individual ideas into a much larger phenomenon. For Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh, the true test was to see if this act of turning outward held up against the library's mission. And it gave us sound footing to apply new skills, technologies, and learning models to the work that we do. This is our mission, to engage our community in literacy and learning. And we've been looking at this in light of all the changes in technology. Engagement changes now, it's, less, it's more than just one-to-one -one interpersonal re interactions, but there's all of the online engagement that goes on, and there's sort of the ways that we move the needle working through community stakeholders and government bodies that, that, that change the, the notion of engagement. There's a question of community, um, both offline and online communities, and the way we've expanded our vision to go beyond just what's inside our walls to what's in our entire region. Um, there's the question of how literacies are changing, um, in addition to just understanding and reading um, printed materials, but it's also understanding, um, you know, digital, me digital media, video, audio, data, code, um, and then being able to possess the skills to respond by creating your own tools on its own. And finally, there's that question of learning. Um, you know, we're seeing new changes in classrooms, and we're seeing new um, 
learning models that the library is becoming a, a real source for. Um, by taking all of this traditional library work and making it visible, public connections, or by making visible public connections to community stakeholders, Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh is becoming this community flywheel, building a space where a wide variety of positive changes are taking place throughout the, the library and throughout the community. In doing so, we're creating these onboarding points for members of the public to get involved, and we're offering a variety of ways in which our value is plainly visible to the public at large. And instead of going to people and saying, this is what we have, we're telling people, this is what you can achieve. And so I'd like to walk you through one of our attempts to put this theory into practice. This is the thing I've been working on more or less since I've been um, part of the team at CLP. But I'd like to preface it a bit by talking a bit about the privilege that CLP enjoys. And of course, a lot has changed in the last few years since the, the tax referendum went through and the market has shifted a bit. Pittsburgh has recovered from a lot of its economic woes. And it's been shifting its focus from being a, a part of manufacturing, moving into education and healthcare, and now it's looking at a pretty dramatic technology boom. We're incredibly fortunate to have Carnegie Mellon, one of the top technology schools in the country, right next door to our main library. We're also really lucky that Google has decided to create an office and reach out to community groups to help build that growing startup community. We're now starting to see other companies follow suit, um, Uber, Apple, Amazon, and so forth. Um, but the principles of connected librarianship should be evergreen, no matter what the environment. And I'm hoping to show how it's really this act of working publicly that can turn the library into a flywheel for your community's information ecosystem. So with that in mind, let's talk about how we can build more meaningful connections with outside groups in our communities. Reaching this point requires us to think more about creating permeable membranes between library services and outside groups. And that means thinking deliberately about what our users need outside the building and how we can place library services in context. Um, and this is that question, how do you feed the wheel? How do you find your inspiration for the services that you're providing to the community? Um, doing so requires developing an understanding of your blind spots, um, looking at the um, outside organizations that you have available. And this could be Google, this could be the local church group next door. Um, and thinking about how we might be able to work through them and how um, some of these other groups, whether it's you know, the Y or whether it's an after school program, can work through us as well. And looking at, it's looking at this in light of our strengths and opportunities for growth. Um, in all of these cases, it really requires focusing on collaboration as a driver of action and focusing on the final outcome and using that collective effort to, to make it happen. And this is the really scary part because that means we've got to talk to people. Um, when I moved to Pittsburgh, I made a point to talk to as many people as I could. You know, go grab a coffee in the morning or go grab a beer after work with local patrons, with various artists, with business people, and folks from the local universities. Um, I'd ask each person to recommend someone else for me to talk to, and I'd use that to build my network. I had come into Pittsburgh totally, you know, basically sight unseen. So I really had to do this to build up my network as best I could. Um, I'm definitely something of an introvert. Um, I'd much rather stay at home with my with my kids and my wife and my terrible, terrible dog. Um, so this was really out of my comfort zone. But this helped me really get a working sense of what people valued in the community, both with and without the library's influence. Um, I also took, um, took, my, took that networking cause online. You know, um, when you use your social media channels to listen to your patrons as, and not just broadcast information, um, you can really harness various platforms as a vital listening tool. Um, and it's a really great low impact way to absorb the general sentiment about key issues in your community. Um, for a while I'd set up RSS feeds and various trigger words um, for things that were going on in the community. You know, you can use this for local, you know, for your towns, for schools, for local businesses, and really get a sense of like that, um, just how people feel. Um, I had taken to Reddit. Um, I had, this can be really hit or miss because in some cases Red, Reddit can be kind of a scary place. <laughs> no more, no worse pit of scum and villainy. But um, the Pittsburgh Reddit happens to be really well moderated and after talking to the moderators there I decided to jump in and do what was called an Ask Me Anything or an AMA. Um, and this became a really great way to introduce myself, talk a bit about the strategic plan, and get a feel for really what it was that people, that people wanted out of this library service. Um, the important thing here is really to keep listening. 
Um, you know, this ties into a concept that's known as ambient awareness or ambient intimacy. Um, where all of the bits and pieces of ourselves that we leave online contribute to a much more comprehensive understanding of who we are and who our network is. Even if we don't engage with these people directly, we can get to know them by absorbing all of this online chatter. Um, the more you do this, the more patterns start to emerge. Between all the data we saw on the exploding startup scene and the growth in people who were using library space to develop their own personal projects, I started seeing this real undercurrent of interest from what I started to call embryonic entrepreneurs, people who were following the startup scene and kind of feeling, you know, like they wanted to dip a toe in the water, but they didn't quite know how to do it. And of course, they had day jobs and lives and other responsibilities that didn't allow them to really get out of the house. Um, they didn't really, you know, they didn't have a place to go. They didn't have the money to join a startup incubator. And of course, the library, by the time they could extricate themselves from their other, you know, real life responsibilities, the library was closed. Um, and so this is where we started seeing a number of these, these voice desires for the library to hold these little like get stuff done nights where we stayed open and provided resources for, to help people get going. Uh, if you don't listen to the public, if you don't keep an eye on these sort of like ambient awareness things, then you really start to miss out on these opportunities. While I was having these conversations, uh, we were also seeking to back up these bits of qualitative research with something a bit more quantitative. Um, we've been using a tool called Policy Map to plot out our early literacy outreach efforts um, and contrast them to where local daycare centers exist. And this has enabled us to see where we're doing a good job and what areas that we're not hitting. Um, and so, you know, you can see the map of and this kind of gives us an idea, like the stars are all the daycare centers, and then the, the orange squares there are the, are the libraries. So we can get a sense of where the places where we can reach out to multiple daycare centers in one spot, particularly if there's a park nearby, so we can go into a story time and connect with all of these people at once. Um, but as we started to go deeper and deeper into this and really incorporate more data-driven decision-making into our work, it quickly occurred to us that we really don't know a thing about data-driven decision-making. Um, and it was around this time um, that my that all of my early morning or early evening uh, conversations took me to the door of Bob Graddock, who's a civic data researcher at the University of Pittsburgh. He also happens to be the head of the uh, local Code for America brigade. And for those of you who don't know, Code for America is a group of hobbyists and civic officials, and professionals, and academics um, that work uh, to push for better transparency in government by making this by making civic data more open and easier to use, Code for America really hopes to demystify that concept of big data and to use it as a tool for inviting wider public participation in municipal issues and as a way of pushing for transparency in, in what's going on in the city. And here you can see, um, uh, this is uh, the, uh, in the, the bottom left, uh, the, the recently elected mayor, Bill Peduto. Um, we had, there's a Code for America Brigade working in Pittsburgh this year on procurement. And so this day became an opportunity for us to connect with them and really look at how the library can harness this concept of open data to push for community action. And on the right here, this is an example of one of the apps that the Code for America Brigade has, has de or that the city has developed through by embracing open data. And that's a snowplow tracker, which in Pittsburgh in the winter is really important to know whether or not the plow is running and whether or not they've actually run through your neighborhood. And for me, you know, this is all, this is like library and catnip. Um, several of us on staff really sensed the opportunity here. And we started asking ourselves how the library could leverage its assets in order to create a mutually beneficial relationship with the city and with the Code for America Brigade. Um, so once we've identified this potential partner, um, it's time to start thinking comprehensively about how you can turn this into a working partnership. You know, it's really one thing simply to attend meetings um, and to have those, like, nice little glad handling sessions where you go and you say, look, we agree on this and look how we can make things happen. Um, but to really move toward a concrete outcome really takes, really makes, really requires making some deliberate decisions about what each side is, is going to do. And so you, this is where you want to sit down outside of any of the partnerships and really ask yourself, what do you want from them? What's the outcome you're trying to drive? You know, what do your partners want from you? And how do you reconcile those two efforts? Um, in the case of our early work with Open Pittsburgh, this really took the form of simply providing space 
they were looking for venues where they could bring people together. And of course, the library provided kind of the institutional heft and that air of legitimacy where we could kind of make that stuff happen. Um, early May of, or late May 2014, we hosted the National Day of Civic Hacking at our Homewood branch. Um, and uh, Homewood's an interesting neighborhood on the east end of the city that's primarily uh, African American and it's been largely left out of a lot of the, the changes that have been going on. But we deliberately chose this as a way of identifying, looking for ways we could use open data to draw more attention to the organic actions that were already taking place in the neighborhood. Um, among the things we did during this day was to start filling out this, this product, which is the U.S. City Open Data Census. And this was a tool developed by Code for America uh, to index all of the open data resources that are tied to specific city departments across the country. Uh, and this is a case where librarian skills really suited us particularly well. Um, you know, this requires you to, you know, sort through government websites, which can all be particularly complex, and sussing out the useful information. You know, this is the kind of thing where someone with strong information literacy skills, you know, we've got that on lock. So, I mean, as you're doing this, you want to think about how your own interactions work and how you can make them more visible to the community. Of course, in this index, we were able to mark where we participated and we were able to sort of claim each of these little census tags as something that the library contributed to. Um, you know, it's just, uh, so if you can keep those roles clear, you'll quickly gain a much bigger level of trust. Um, this is going to make it much easier for, for both you and your partners to call out the support that the other group provides. Uh, to get there uh, requires taking a few things under consideration. Um, as we mentioned before, as you have a you have a deliberate sense of what each side wants in the partnership. We also have to have a deliberate sense of what each side is going to do to make the to make the outcome take place. And then there's that question of making the partnership visible. You know, if these things are happening just in a meeting room, you know, there's no way that your stakeholders, and particularly the people who provide funding for your organization, are going to to make a sense of how you're making this real. And through this, you're working to turn your combined efforts into a much greater whole. You know, the goal here is to reach something of a symbiotic state where both sides can back one another up, talk up each other's goals in a clear fashion to, to others, and seek out additional connections within the extended network. Um, and so far in doing all this, we found that there's much more space for our legacy librarian skills than we thought. Um, this is another one of the current projects that we're working on in our partnership with the Open Pittsburgh Brigade. Um, and this is, uh, it's Ask PGH. Um, it's not yet launched yet, but it's designed as a question and answer form, kind of modeled after Stack Exchange or Yahoo Answers. Um, people can post questions, and folks can earn karma points for providing good answers or voting um, particular questions up and down as things that are important to the community. Um, once this launches, we aim to make library staff uh, moderators and the people who are responsible for seeding the library with content. Of course, this is a piece that really speaks to our, our skills. And as we see our reference stats go down, we're trying to find ways to make that kind of, that, that body of knowledge that our staff has and the skills at research and information literacy that we, that we, that we bring to the table all the more visible in this way. Um, this also dovetailed with the hiring of our web developer, um, who we added late last year. And this has become something of a pet project for him. He helped to design, you know, as we, at the time, he was just working on updating the website, which was a pretty menial task. And so this gave him an outlet as he got to build, like, the actual style sheets and do the, uh, the pattern library for, for the site. Um, all of these parts really came together in a way that's hopefully going to become a real win-win for both us and for the, uh, for the brigades. It's also going to be, as, as mentioned below, it's going to be a great way for us to get community input because, again, it's another way of getting that, that kind of ambient intimacy um, from our community members. This is a flyer for Open Pittsburgh. Uh, as you can see, our, our role in the partnership becomes even vis even more visible. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Mr. Rogers comes out of Pittsburgh, so, you know, we end up providing mentions to him wherever we can. Um, this is just another way of making this stuff more visible to, to passersby. 
Um, as we mentioned earlier, we also launched, uh, after listening to the feedback from our patrons, we launched this, uh, we launched the Work Nights program, um, responding to the changes from the Reddit thread and in, in our conversations with all of those embryonic entrepreneurs. Um, and we, we started hosting these once a month at one of our branches. And this is still going on. It's continuing to grow in audience. Uh, we're bringing staff in who have particular um, skills in launching, uh, in you know, business knowledge and doing uh, demographic research, and we're using that to help people launch, you know, their own projects. Um, and you know, when we started this, you know, we needed to, we weren't exactly sure what kind of audience we were going to have. You know, we thought if we turn, if we just simply kept the library open, you know, were people actually going to come? And that's where that's a place where we sought out Open Pittsburgh to help us really. Um, to see this pool of, of audience members. They started using this as a place for their own work nights. And, you know, we used them as sort of that seed group to help us really build a crowd. So this was a case where we both had mutual goals to, to work toward a, uh, you know, a, a, a level of success. Um, the next part is the, the question of reflection and this issue of how you can use all of this to create an ongoing narrative. Um, when I talk to my staff, I refer to this as creating continuity from one transaction or one interaction to the next. Um, any set of partnerships you have uh, with your community members should be able to carry over from one activity to the next. And as you get your, as you start to fulfill one goal, you've got to think about how this is going to be the springboard for the next action you're going to take. Um, and then, you know, in doing so, you know, as we start to build our network, we're, we're building this shared trust that we have between us and our stakeholders to blur the boundaries between what's our work and what's their work. Um, as that becomes more visible, it becomes a, it creates a magnet for new partners and stakeholders to take part. And it gives us more material that we can document and then share with our, with our outgoing stakeholders. You know, we're, by working together, you know, us and the brigade, for for example, are, are creating this really strong sense of benevolent collusion um, between one another. One of the places this has manifested itself is in the Steel City Code Fest. Um, we hosted this at the main library uh, in February of this year. And this is a case where we invited about close to 100 people to spend the night at the library. It was a 24-hour hackathon. Um, where people worked with civic groups and community organizations to develop apps um, to help them meet new goals. Um, the, like for example, the, the, the winning app that won this year was uh, for an organization called 412 Food Rescue. And what they do is they connect um, food banks with um, grocery stores and restaurants who have food that's close to expiration but that can still be donated out. And they built this app as kind of like an Uber-like tool so that they could, you know, a restaurant could say, I have, you know, 50 pounds of, of vegetables. Um, I need someone to come pick them up. A volunteer can get a ping on their app, and they come and they pick it up, and they can deliver it to the food pantry. Um, we also used this to host a civic tech fair, and our entire gallery space was filled with um, people checking out some of the activities taken on by the library and the brigade. And we had um, training activities and like code light training uh, for children and for teens um, ended up getting, you know, having our, our main branch completely full. Um, and we've been using the Code Fest as a way of extending our reach with complementary city organizations. You know, this was a big event with a lot of heft from the city and um, the extended um, tech community. So we wanted to use this to give them, to, to bring some of our um, some of our patrons uh, to give them some visibility and to connect them with some people that they wouldn't have necessarily worked with before. Um, this young fellow uh, comes from the Maker's Place, which is a local after-school program um, in that Homewood neighborhood that helps to connect uh, kids with steam skills and coding skills and entrepreneurship. And here he is meeting with one of our Code for America fellows, where he's uh, witnessing, you know, he got to watch the pitches from the, the tech teams, and he got to ask questions of the participants. And you can see here they're, they're having a really good time. And by bringing all of these resources together and then having that big expo on the last day of the event, we're really hoping to provide some real-world context for both in-school and out-of-school learning. And really demonstrating to the community not only the value of code, but the value of the library's role as the hub for all of this action to take place. 
And this in turn has attracted the attention of, of many other groups. Code and Supply is, a, is an organization that does tech training throughout the city on, you know, they have um, at least two classes a week on code. And they started, after this event, they reached out to us to do a hackathon. Um, we hosted a second one uh, a couple of weeks later in the library. And we've been, they've been coming to our work nights as well. And that's led to some really interesting cross-pollination between the code and supply group, which tends to be a little more, let's say, capitalist in their focus, and the open Pittsburgh folks who tend to be a little more philanthropic, let's say. Um, and so this was, you know, all of this, it's just another case where the assets that we're already providing allows us to present a new jumping on point for a group that we that hadn't seen a reason to really interact with us before. You know, a lot of people didn't see the library as a place to develop this new type of literacy. But, you know, of course, literacy is in our mission, so we had to push that as best we could. Um, and then the final part of all of this is really understanding when to let go of the reins on the partnership. You know, all relationships have a lifespan, and sometimes you've got to recognize that by setting it free, it can take on a life of its own. Um, as with the iPad group, I sort of reached a point where I realized that my presence really didn't add much to the program. Once I created a venue and brought people together, I didn't have to do much to lead to steer them on. All I had to do was kind of sit back and really just take all the credit for all the work that they were doing. Um, in a similar sense, my favorite example of this at, at Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh is our language conversation group, Let's Speak English, um, which we've set up many kind of small discussion groups for um, native speakers and language learners alike to come together and speak that given language um, in a kind of loose social environment. And we've got um, groups for you know, Spanish, Japanese, uh, Mandarin, um, Italian, and you know, a host of other languages. Um, and the more and more of these we started to offer, the more and more the group members started to want to do things outside of the uh, outside of the the meetings. You know, this is now largely a self-managing group. You know, the library staff are simply on hand to kind of handle the room reservations and make sure that people can get in. Um, the group attendees kind of set their own agendas. They create their own activities, and they form active relationships outside of meetings. This is actually a group of folks from several Let's Speak English groups, and they decided to start their own band. They found out how many of them have musical talents, and so they started to, you know, come together and practice outside of the Let's Speak English group. Um, several groups have even started to meet for meals outside of the library, and we've I'm, I'm pleased to say that we've got we've got at least one couple who's gotten engaged from meeting at this, this language discussion group, and all of this comes around full circle um, because we've they've because of their connection to the library is so strong they've come back and they've started teaching multilingual story times as volunteers to the public, and so it's just a way of keeping that cycle going and making this partnership and our library impact more visible. Um, so this is where it gets interesting. Um, to bring this, uh, you know, in summary, you know, our goal here is to, is to focus on the library's strengths as, in, as, as the source of literacy and learning in the city of Pittsburgh, defining clear roles between ourselves and our community partners in such a way so that building that level of trust in such a way so that we can work through one another to connect with the larger community and achieve our goals, um, making it visible in such a way that, that people who wouldn't necessarily look at us in a certain way start to get it and we start to make these things click in context. And then connecting the dots, um, making sure that one one big connection leads into the next one, which leads into the next one, and, and so on and so forth. You know, by leveraging all of these core assets, we're really making these connections work. Um, in this time, you know, I've talked a lot about kind of the raw materials that the library has in abundance, you know, and for, I think for just about any library, it's, you know, about space, it's about knowledge, and it's about time. But, you know, we can trade on a lot more of these things in ways that some of the more forward-thinking partners may not necessarily think about. You know, we've got tools like nostalgia, we've got trust, and we have this sense of institutional heft. You know, as for, for CLP, we've been, you know, one of, we've been a, institution in the city for 125 years, and that's not something that people really ignore. So um, just to sort of wrap up, I want to take a look at how some of these relationships we've built and how we're starting to push these just a little bit further. 
um, because our our civic partners are pushing along right with us. Um, The mayor's office, for example, just released its Roadmap for Inclusive Innovation, which is its comprehensive guide and strategic plan for making Pittsburgh, um, for embracing that idea of innovation and the fact that there's this growing startup and entrepreneurial scene and all of these tech companies coming in but to making sure that we can push all that while still being, without sacrificing its egalitarian spirit. And of course, Pittsburgh has been the heart of the, the steel industry has had a strong sense of kind of collective, you know, let's roll up our sleeves and get stuff done together. And the city doesn't take, doesn't want to let go of that as all of this new, uh, all of these new ventures come in. And the library happens to be all over this document. Um, they see us as, basically the boots on the ground for a number of projects. And we're really pleased to be recognized as such and to be visible in this way. Um, A few examples of this um, include the city's summer employment program for teens, which is commonly known as Learn and Earn. Um, This program, um, when it started, it had a capacity of about 500 students. This year they decided to triple it. Um, And the library has leveraged its connection with the various employers that we work with through our Job and Career Center to help the city find new partners and stakeholders. Um, we're serving as a host site of our own, um, bringing in selected, we brought in selected students over the summer for single day work study experiences and also provide a small group of them with actual employment to span the length of the program. Um, you know, as you start to think about these opportunities within your own community, this is a good time to ask, what is it that makes people come to your library? You know, how do you leverage this this sensibility to expand your reach? Um, in a network system, in an information ecosystem, the more we can bridge these connections and leverage those those core elements that we have, um, the more successful we're going to be. Um, likewise, we have Q, which stands for Connecting Urban Entrepreneurs, which is a program that Google Civic Partnership Group brought to us. Um, and this is basically a uh, intensive 12-week training program to help small minority-owned businesses put their businesses online. Um, and we used our connections with community partners um, to help put this cohort together. Um, and we helped connect them with local trainers and helped really teach them, allowed them to become a network unto themselves. And it served to help them you know, put their businesses online, in some cases start their business from nothing um, and expanding their visibility to the uh, to the outside world. Likewise, um, our Literacy Unlocked program allows us to provide library services, story time, literacy, and career training to occupants of the Allegheny County Jail. Um, so that's helping to helping our helping offenders to find a clear path back to civilian life. Um, in many of these cases, we're connecting with people who had never set foot in the library before. Um, upon release, you know, by building this connection with folks in kind of a vulnerable space, um, the library then becomes the safe area for them once they get out um, and for their families um, and that trusted resource for their own future educational and career opportunities. And by extending this safe space and making it known to the wider community, we're also working to humanize um, you know, former offenders. It helps, we're really helping to dispel some of the fears and uh, misconceptions that the rest of the population may have about the incarcerated. You know, service to the underserved is always going to be a part of our core mission. And I think it's time that, you know, we decided as an organization to really lean into this role and to really own that, that idea of the library as a safe space. This act of empathy not only broadens our user base, but it provides positive examples for the rest of our community. Um, Each of these mutually beneficial partnerships can help us drive more substantial conversations about important issues in the community. Um, I've been working with the Create Lab, which is a space at Carnegie Mellon devoted to uh, leveraging technology to drive community innovation and encourage public discourse. This is their, one of their most recent products, which is, this, which is called the SPEC. Um, it's an air quality monitor designed to be used in the home. Um, and uh, what it does is it measures the concentration of particulate matter in the air. It's not necessarily, it doesn't differentiate between one type of particulate matter and another. Like water vapor looks the same as smoke or dust, for example. Um, but the SPEC allows you to get a sense of what activities inside your house, whether it's vacuuming or cooking or showering, contributes to the, the density of particles um, in, in your overall air quality. 
Uh, we started checking out specs uh, at one branch late last year, and we since expanded that system wide. And they haven't sat on this shelf ever since. Um, you know, this takes into account Pittsburgh's long history as that kind of dirty town. You know, being at the heart of the steel industry then and now, kind of surrounded by the uh, oil and gas, the fracking industry um, now. Um, you know, it's people are concerned about environmental health. And so we've been checking out these devices for the same reason that we teach technology classes. We want to give our patrons an opportunity to understand some fairly complex issues on their own terms and provide the context to, you know, make it hit home, so to speak. Um, leveraging our role as a public institution enables us to be this gathering space to engage with others about ways to assess air quality in their homes and in their neighborhoods and to advocate for um, better environmental decision making throughout the region. As we start to push this conversation forward, we've been asking patrons who check out these devices to share some of their data back with us. Um, and this, you know, all of this kind of calls for some help and greater assistance sorting through the information. And, you know, of course, as, as you can probably tell, we have our work with Open Pittsburgh, the brigade, to really help us lead the way. And of course, you know, these are, these are fairly high level ideas that we're working with. But, you know, in, in each of your own cases, you want to ask yourself, what are the issues that are taking place in your communities? How can you further the conversation through the services and resources that you have um, inside your walls? And to help create new feedback loops for your users to reflect, respond, and take action. By giving people these tools, um, no matter what shape they take, um, this is uh, giving people the tools to make informed decisions is another real essential part of making our value known. Of course, all of this comes back to this, the, the, the concept of storytelling and making your work visible to, to the larger community. Um, every one of these activities that take place in our community tell a story, and this gives us the opportunity for the library to use our other core skill, that of the, the aggregator and the documenter of community information. Um, Show Your Work is another product that we, or is another program series that we launched. Well, this runs about three times a year now. And this is our way of connecting with the entrepreneurial community or some of those embryonic entrepreneurs who have a, a, a product or an idea that isn't quite ready for, you know, the places like the startup incubators that have a much more competitive um, uh, stance. Um, this, uh, we have an application process. People come in, and then they're given five minutes to pitch their idea um, to an audience of their peers, as well as kind of a panel of local entrepreneurs or people from the tech community. Um, what's been really surprising about the about these events is that um, at each of the well, we've now held three of them, and we're about to have our fourth um, next month. Um, there's been, at each of these, there's been some presenter who's proposed building some kind of community archive. Um, you know, things that tend to go really niche toward community subgroups. Our first one was someone who was trying to build an archive of local artists um, and their kind of efforts and their gallery showings and really thinking seriously about how you document the, the art scene in the city. And then the second one was somebody who wanted to document the, the punk scene, um, the music scene that had been going on for the last you know, 25 years, the, well, in, in their experience. And this was someone who somehow in their infinite wisdom just took all the pictures that they had when, that they took when they were 15 and 16 years old and at the time indexed all of them with the names, the locations, and dates. So they were, you know, kind of thinking like a librarian early on. And, you know, this set off a light bulb for us because not only are we telling their story, but it creates this opportunity for us to think about all of these little new venues for storytelling and how we might make those visible to a larger audience. Um, this is really where it all comes full circle for us. After planning this flag, you know, we've, we've brought people together. We then get them talking, and then we start to collect it and turn it into new sets of library resources for the next set of patrons to use, enjoy, and be inspired by. Um, to go back to the, uh, the open data stuff, um, we're now focusing our attentions on making this a formal project and a formal partnership. Uh, last week, we witnessed the launch of the Western Pennsylvania Regional Data Center, uh, which is a partnership between the city and the county to take 
um, its government information, um, reconcile all of the discrepancies that exist between their departments, and put it online in kind of a way that people can access and um, interpret on their own. Uh, we actually ended up hosting a hackathon at our library directly after the launch. Um, and the stories that come out of this, this actually just happened last week. Um, the stories that come out of here are really going to drive our next set of com community actions. We're hoping to go all in on taking our, our data literacy efforts um, beyond what we're just doing with this partnership. Um, and we hope to use this as, the, as one of the tools for doing so. Um, all of this, you know, all of the tools that we're embracing here uh, really speaks to the other type of connections the library's building, and that's connections over time. You know, this is my, my older son, um, aside from my seven-week-old. He just turned four, and he's really starting to lap me in the way he understands tech and embraces new things as they roll out. Um, you know, he, I, when the, the, before the baby was born, I asked him what he wanted to name his little brother, and he told me Netflix. Um, so go figure. Um, I start to think about how we're going to, I, th I think of him basically when I think about how we're going to create links between our existing services so that the library doesn't vanish for him as an institution when he becomes a teenager or when he goes to college or when he becomes an adult. Um, you know, by looking at the connective tissue that's going to make an impact in his life, um, I've got to find the ways that the library can be connected to that so that we can prevent the drop-off that exists um, traditionally and to really reflect on our role as this institution of lifelong learning. And that all of this ties into that one last asset that libraries have at their disposal, and that's the idea of, of nostalgia. Um, Digital Public Library of America and then um, scholar John Palfrey he talks about how libraries need to create nostalgia for the future. You know, they, we want to take people and make them feel nostalgic 50 years down the road for the things that we're doing today. Um, and this is the, the final call to action for all of you and say, what are the memories that you're creating now? And how is that going to affect your user's regard for your institution um, way down the road? Um, by building all of these connections and making them visible, I think that um, both our library and all of your libraries can not only own your role in the information ecosystem, but you can create irrefutable arguments about your impact that's going to reap benefits years down the road. Um, the memories that you're making now can go a long way toward reinforcing the essential role that we play um, to our communities. Making these visible outward-facing connections to our community partners is the first step in that direction, no matter what technique, no matter what trend, or no matter what technology you use to get there. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to uh, take some time for questions. We've got a few minutes left if, if anybody um, has do, anything. Toby, and I think I captured the one real question during the session. It was okay. from Peggy George who said she was curious the, about the typical makeup of the code and supply group. Mm -hmm. Age, men, women, educational background, etc. Um, it the it varies depending on the on the the task. Um, it's generally um, what you might imagine. It's it's younger. It's twenties to thirties, and it's male, and it's um, it's and it's mostly white, but it's also, a, it's, there's a few other demographics in there. There's a few other groups in the city that have been really working to connect tech skills to um, more diverse audiences. Um, and um, we've been working to, to, to work with what they have, you know, find ways to make their work uh, connect with the library and vice versa. Um, but the, yeah, that's, they're just one of several groups in the community that are that are trying to tackle tech literacy. So if you have a question for Toby, you can put it in the chat. We have a couple of minutes still, or you can raise your virtual hand, the third icon over, the hand icon, and we'll give you the microphone. So Toby, sometimes I get caught doing something technical during a talk, so if I miss this, I apologize. But in our community, meetup.com is really the compelling force for people gathering. Does do you have you done anything with Meetup? 
Um, we have in some in some places, and actually that's usually through the the partner groups tend to use Meetup a lot. Um, like both Open Pittsburgh and Code and Supply use that as their primary way of announcing events. And you know, so in some way, uh, in in some ways, we're kind of putting on a mask when we when they post an event for us there. Um, you know, they're they're hosting a Code and Supply event at the library. But you know, because it's a partner event, it 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 looks differently to our users as it does to them. Um, it, yeah, it really depends on what the um, you know. There's there's lots of different things depending on what's taken hold in your in your community. You know, I mentioned Reddit. Nextdoor is another is another service that that's in a lot of communities. Um, a lot of places have those kind of like hyper local news sites that become kind of the the local watering. There's the local uh, Community-wide uh, water cooler. A lot of places have Facebook groups. You know, it's just a matter of kind of looking around and getting a feel for what place has the most traction with with your users. Interesting. So Peggy also asks, can you handle more people in the projects? Mm -hmm. And do yeah. you provide any kind of childcare services? Mm -hmm. um, we haven't really connected the childcare portion yet. Um, it's definitely something that that we've we've been trying to think about, um, but it's not it's not really a nut that we've cracked yet. Um, we can definitely handle more people in the projects. That's been a big focus now. Since I've been taking these on as projects of my own, we're now looking to take them to scale and really making this part of you know our branch staff. You know, we have 19 locations throughout the city. Um, how we can use them to how we can use them to work either in a smaller scale or as part of a collective effort. Um, yeah, and yeah, you're you're absolutely right. Child care would significantly increase participation. We just haven't quite figured out the, the logistics behind it yet. Yeah, and then it looked like um, Jamie said the AMA was a really good idea. I wonder what an equivalent could be for a smaller city or library system. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that's just a matter of looking around. I think um, I, th I think Facebook. Uh, there's every there's there's tons of little neighborhood groups that um, you know sometimes they're they're at the block level through some weird either it's nostalgia or just like a sense of like watching the train wreck as it goes by. I still follow the, the ones from my old neighborhood in Chicago. Um, so. There's, I, I know that there's lots of examples out there, and really it's just a matter of either looking around for them or talking to your patrons, which I know is gasp, frightening, um, but and asking them where, how do they, you know, develop? Where is that community effort found online? So we're probably at the close, unless someone has a final question they'd like to ask. I know we're at the end of the day because my voice is hoarse. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thanks, Toby. That was fantastic. I'm clapping for you. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate. Uh, I really appreciate all your all your questions and your attention. You have to hover over the smiley face and go to the <laughs> applause button. It's um, not as okay. intuitive as it might uh, be. I got it. <laughs> nice. Thanks, Toby. That was terrific. People yes. really loved that. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. All right, well, good okay, thanks to everybody. Good night, everyone, or good morning to those of you on the good other side to, of the country of the world. Good night to Toby. Good night to all of you. Thanks for a great day. Well, what a fun event this year. This is the official close of Library 2.015. Take care. Bye now. Yeah. yeah. Well, congratulations on another.